Well, dear colleagues, dear employees from 3M, ladies and gentlemen, I also want to give you a warm welcome. Warm is probably leading us in the middle of the topic of this session. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to attend together with you this meeting, the forgotten vital parameter core temperature. Um, let me first make a few remarks because I'm wondering if this headline can be true. Um, we are here together today during this highlight European Anesthesia Congress and have this meeting, temperature of our patients' normothermia. And this um, meeting is standing in a line with the last year ESA uh, at the last year European Society Congress. We had in Paris also a very interesting meeting on the same topic, and we learned about the UK guidelines on temperature management, and we learned about the cost um, um, effects if we don't keep our patients normothermic. So there are a lot of initiatives on patient temperature, and so can this headline be true, the forgotten vital parameter. Moreover, we have two excellent speakers today with us, and both of them are extremely well recognized for basic research and outcome research regarding the importance of keeping patients normothermic. So from this point of view, is it really true that core temperature is a forgotten vital parameter? On the other hand, we all feel we have not accomplished our mission because um, most of you know the survey of 2007 of the Troisson publication about temperature monitoring in the daily routine. Only 30% of our patients roughly will be carefully monitored for this vital parameter. And moreover, I'm coming from a community hospital and I can tell you that we spend about 100,000 euro a year for about 13,000 surgical patients for doing temperature management. And we have a standardized protocol for measurement beginning with anesthesia till discharge from the recovery room. And we use a lot of warming machines, forced air warming and fluid management and still the latest numbers from a 3,000 patient analyze, we still have a 30% hypothermia rate of inadvertent hypothermia in our surgical patients. So that's probably the reason. Maybe it's not the forgotten vital parameter, but it's a vital parameter we really have to address our efforts. And so I'm, I'm very happy. Then I can introduce you to our two speakers. And we will begin this um, meeting with the first presentation with Professor Kurz. And she will give a presentation about um, the physiology of temperature management and um, outcome-related um, effects of normothermia and inadvertent hypothermia. And I would like to ask Professor Kurz to give us her presentation. Okay, good afternoon. Yeah, at least you know now that I traveled a lot. But anyways, today um, I was asked to talk about uh, the basics, physiology of thermoregulation, and the outcomes, mainly the adverse outcomes of perioperative hypothermia. So, normally, Core temperature is very, very, is, is actually exactly regulated at around 37 degrees. So all of you here probably now have a core temperature around that. If your core temperature increases slightly, this causes a thermoregulatory defense mechanism, which is with an increase in core temperature, sweating. If your core temperature decreases a tiny bit, your thermoregulatory response is peripheral arterial venous shunt vasoconstriction. And if your core temperature decreases even further, here, then you react with shivering. 
the range between the core temperature at which sweating happens and the core temperature at which vasoconstriction happens is this tiny, tiny thing here and is called the interthreshold range. Now, when you are awake and not anesthetized, this range is very, very small, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 degrees. And that changes dramatically during anesthesia. As you can see here, during anesthesia, the interthreshold range can be as large as three to four degrees, which means your body reacts a lot later to thermoregular, to, uh, to, to changes in core temperature, and that's partially why our patients become hypothermic during surgery. Now, all anesthetics which have been tested so far affect central thermoregulatory control. And I put on this slide only some of the most commonly used anesthetics or opioids. We have desfluran, alfentanil, dexmedidomidine, and propofol. And I'll only explain one of these graphs. Let's choose maybe desfluran. If, if you look here, 0% of desfluran or without anesthesia, you see the exact same uh, picture as I've just showed in the previous slides, a very small interthreshold range here. As the dose of desfluran increases, the core temperature threshold for vasoconstriction and shivering decreases. So that means if a patient has approximately one meg of, like here, 6% of desfluran anesthesia, the patient needs to cool down to a core temperature of approximately 34 degrees before thermoregulatory defense mechanisms are initiated. So patients do have to become hypothermic. And as you can see here, uh, the pattern of how that develops is pretty much the same with every one of these drugs. The only drug that's been tested and doesn't have a very large effect on thermoregulatory control is midazolam. Now, hypothermia during anesthesia always develops in a very characteristic pattern. There's a very old slide here, that's nothing new. What happens is that at the beginning of um, anesthesia, core temperature drops quite rapidly, one to one and a half degrees. Then it keeps dropping, and at some point it develops a core temperature plateau, and every one of these phases has its own ideology. The first phase, so the, the quick drop in core temperature here, is due to what we call redistribution hypothermia. What happens is the patient, comes into, the patient comes into the OR, has a normal core temperature, let's say 37 degrees. The peripheral temperature at this point in time is usually th four to five degrees colder than the core temperature because patients are vasoconstricted, because they are cold, they are afraid, they have pain, many, many reasons. Then we induce anesthesia, and anesthesia causes peripheral vasodilation, and that causes a flow of heat from the warmer core to the colder periphery. And that's basically pure physics. The second phase here, the linear drop of core temperature is due to the fact that at that point in time, the metabolic heat production of the patient is less than the heat loss. And eventually, our patients develop a core temperature plateau, which is when peripheral vasoconstriction, the thermoregulatory uh, defense mechanism kicks in, and heat that's produced metabolically is constrained to the core. That doesn't mean that the patient doesn't lose any heat anymore, but core temperature at that point in time sta stabilizes, and that's why we call it a plateau. Now, that was the that's the case with general anesthesia, but it's not that much different with regional anesthesia. 
Uh, regional anesthesia causes a central, peripheral, and behavioral inhibition of thermoregulatory control. What you see here is, again, patients, or actually in this case volunteers, who have no anesthesia with a very small interthreshold range here, and then the same volunteers with a spinal anesthesia, and you see that the vasoconstriction threshold core temperature at which vasoconstriction is initiated uh, is significantly decreased. So patients under regional anesthesia get just as hypothermic as patients under general anesthesia. And as you might imagine, if you add regional anesthesia and general anesthesia, it's even worse. That is a fairly old study, actually in patients who had either a general anesthesia with enferon, and here you see how old that study is, because that hasn't been used, I guess, in 10 years, 15, about, yeah. And patients who had an enferon anesthesia plus an epidural anesthesia. What you see here that both patient groups drop their core temperature at the beginning, so redistribution hypothermia. At some point, the vasoconstriction threshold kicks in within the general anesthesia group and causes a core temperature plateau. In the patients with combined anesthesia, vasoconstriction kicks in much later at the lower core temperature. And we do not get a perfect core temperature plateau. And the reason is just that the patients have a sympathectomy and basically part of the body can't really react and they keep losing more heat that way. So pretty much any type of anesthesia causes hypothermia. It depends a little bit on the drugs and the dose, well, not on the drugs per se, but on the doses of the drugs you use to which extent that hypothermia develops. Now, we know that hypothermia exists. It's been shown many years ago, actually, that it's associated with um, uh, side effects and also some severe consequences. First one is it changes pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of many drugs we use. For example, the uh, volatile anesthetics, like the MAC of halothane and isoflurin, decreases, for example, 5% per degree reduction in core body temperature. So, so, so theoretically, one could say with hypothermia, the drugs are more potent. I'm not sure that that's the exact right uh, 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 terminus. IV anesthetics, for example, propofol, three degrees of hypothermia increases the plasma concentration by 30%. And muscle relaxants, let's point out maybe vacuronium, the duration of action is more than doubled by two degrees of core hypothermia. And, and this is important because we try to use, we, we pay a whole lot of money for short-acting drugs. If, if we use short-acting drugs and then we get a prolonged action only because our patients get cold, that doesn't make too much sense. Um, consequences, post-operative consequences of hypothermia start with prolonged time in the recovery room. This is a study in 250 patients undergoing colorectal surgery where we looked here on the y-axis on the percentage of patients who were ready for discharge at any given point in time. Time is here and you see that at any given point in time, 40, 80, whatever minutes, more normal thermic patients were ready for discharge as opposed to hypothermic patients. We used an Aldred scoring system for this part of the graph, and then here we just added one more requirement to the score, which was a core temperature of greater than 36 degrees, and you see the difference is enormous. In numbers, 
this means about half an hour later discharge, this means about one and a half hours later discharge from the PEQ. A consequence of hypothermia that happens intraoperatively and to a certain extent postoperatively is increased uh, blood loss. Hypothermia affects the coagulation system, changes uh, platelet function, to a certain extent changes bleeding times. And this study is a meta-analysis of all existing randomized studies in which patients were randomized to either uh, intraoperative normothermia with active warming or hypothermia without active warming. I have to say that all the studies I'm presenting were done more than 15, or some of those, not all, but done more than 15 years ago when active warming was new and the standard of care was no warming. What you see here in regards to blood loss most of, almost all of the studies favor, that's a forest plot, and they favor normothermia in numbers. Uh, there was 16% lower average blood loss in normothermic patients. And as you might imagine, this translates to perioperative transfusion requirements. And um, these are almost the same studies. And here in the forest plot, you again see most of them favor normothermia. And we saw that normothermia is associated with 22% less risk of transfusion. Now, one very often cited consequence of perioperative hypothermia are postoperative wound infections. Those might happen, first of all, because hypothermia per se affects the immune system, but also it causes peripheral vasoconstriction, which we've gone over uh, 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 previously. And if you get vasoconstriction, this decreases peripheral perfusion. Perfusion is needed to carry oxygen to wounds and tissues. Oxygen is needed for bacterial killing by neutrophils. And if, if, if you don't have oxygen and your defense mechanisms don't work as well, you might have a uh, higher incidence of postoperative wound infections. And in this particular study, again, patients were randomized to normothermia, active warming, where the average core temperature was around 36.6 degrees at the end of surgery, hypothermia, not, no, no extra warming, average core temperature about two degrees less, and you see that the incidence of wound infections in the hypothermic patients was three times as high as opposed to the normothermic patients, and even when it came to duration of hospitalization, Hypothermic patients here were in the hospital significantly longer, more than one and a half days longer than normothermic patients. Now, the previous study was, was done in patients undergoing colon surgery. That's why it's such a high wound infection rate. This confirmation study here that was published a bit later is in patients that have more clean type surgery, but you can see the results are, are very similar, a much, much higher wound infection rate in, uh, in hypothermic as opposed to normothermic patients. And there are a whole bunch of other studies that look at similar outcomes. I only want to mention this one, which is actually a retrospective analysis from the Cleveland Clinic, looking at the association between hypothermia and adverse outcomes in patients undergoing cardiac surgery. They had 5,000 patients and divided them up in patients with a core temperature of less than 36 degrees at arrival on the ICU or higher than 36 degrees. And what they showed that patients with a core temperature less than 36 degrees had higher mortality, prolonged mechanical ventilation, 
increased transfusion requirement and prolonged duration of hospitalization. Now, most of the studies I mentioned so far were done years ago, and, and the degree of hypothermia we saw then was quite severe, so two to three degrees uh, in the period period, and you see that, that was from, from our, um, uh, our wound infection study. Patients at the end of surgery had a core temperature a little bit higher than 34 degrees, and, and then it took actually six hours to get these patients back to normothermia. So they were exposed to a severe degree of, or let's say a moderate degree of hypothermia for many hours. Uh, of course, nowadays, in some countries, perioperative warming has become more standard of care. And so we wanted to look at our data um, at the Cleveland Clinic to first of all see what is after now five or six years of warming all patients intraoperatively, what is the incidence and depth of hypothermia and is, is it milder, which would be expected as we actively warm, and is that associated with bad consequences as well? Because don't forget, all the previous studies showed that about, let's say, two degrees of hypothermia are bad. But do we see that even now? In that study, uh, we looked at a little bit over 50,000 patients under general anesthesia. And um, um, I wanted to find out how long during surgery and they might be hypothermic and how deep that would go. So you see here the incidence of hypothermia, y-axis, and the time after induction of anesthesia. The red line are patients that at some point during surgery have a core temperature of less than 36 degrees. We, we kind of always say 36 degrees is what we consider acceptable or normothermia. Whether that's true, I'm, I'm not quite sure. I'm sure Dan will, will, will comment on that later. Um, but what you see is that about 60% of the patients are still, have still have a core temperature of less than 36 degrees at some point, usually within the first 100 minutes after induction of anesthesia, and that, of course, might reflect or does reflect redistribution hypothermia, which, which is easy to, which is difficult to treat when, when patient warming is initiated after induction of anesthesia. So, 60% are below uh, 36. The green line is patients under uh, 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 35.5 degrees. We still have 30%, and only a small percentage of seven to eight actually are below 35, point, uh, uh, 35 degrees. At the end of surgery, many, most patients are normothermic, nowadays when they are actively warm, but there is still about 25% of our patients whom we couldn't rewarm to a core temperature of higher than 36 degrees. So, so you can see it's become a lot better as supposed to, um, to, to, to 15 years ago in institutions that really do active warming. I, I, I don't even want to talk about the high percentage of, of hospitals that don't, but the ones that have initiated it, that has helped with perioperative hypothermia, but there is still some degree of very mild hypothermia. Now, is that bad or not? Because all the previous studies showed that two degrees or more of hypothermia are bad. And we looked at that. Please keep in mind, this is a retrospective analysis. Very large. We, we tried to adjust for all confounding factors, or at least the ones 
we had in our registry and the ones we could come up with, but it's still a retrospective analysis in 51,000 patients. And we looked at core temperature and blood loss. And what you see is actually just the same as we saw in our old studies in the meta-analysis I presented before, that when core temperature decreases, the, uh, 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 the odds for, for um, increased blood loss increase. Uh, so more or less, uh, Hypothermia, again, is associated with increased blood loss. The deeper the hypothermia, the longer the time, the more blood loss. And that's important in this analysis because we actually, we, we, we looked at the depth of hypothermia, but also at the duration, because it's hard to know. Is it worse if your patient has 34 degrees for 30 minutes, or if your patient has 35.5 for three hours. So we need, to, we need to analyze all that together. We also looked at mild hypothermia and duration of hospitalization. And you see a fairly similar picture here. Um, what, we uh, what you see is that with a decrease in core temperature, the uh, odds of, of, of um, um, uh, having incre uh, increased duration of hospitalization increase. What we see here is though that it might be that patients actually really have to drop down to 35 degrees bef before you see a really significant change in duration of hospitalization. And putting it in numbers, it shows that each degree hour of hypothermia, the patients are less than 34.5, which really doesn't happen much anymore, prolongs hospitalization by approximately uh, half a day. Now, to summarize, I think we can agree that normal body temperature is around anywhere between 36.5 to 37.5 degrees. Temperatures of less than 36 degrees are considered hypothermia, and that's what most of the recommendations and guidelines nowadays will tell you. Whether 36 degrees is really the number or whether we shouldn't recommend keeping patients at their starting core temperature, which most certainly is higher than 36, I don't really know yet, but I suspect that that would be the case. Hypotherm, all anesthetics cause impairment of thermoregulatory control. Hypothermia develops in three stages. We have redistribution hypothermia, then a linear decrease of core temperature because heat loss is exceeding metabolic heat production. And eventually, when protective peripheral thermoregulatory responses kick in, we have the core temperature plateau. Hypothermia is associated with important and severe consequences, as for example, and this, this is not a complete list. These are only the ones uh, I consider most important. It changes pharmacokinetics and dynamics of many drugs. It causes prolonged uh, time in the recovery room. It prolongs duration of hospitalization. It increases blood loss and transfusion requirements. Very important when we consider that we all try to use very restrictive transfusion regimens nowadays out of many, many reasons and it increases the incidence of surgical wound infections. Hypothermia was severe 15 years ago without active warming. Even in, in, in places where there is active warming as a standard of care, there is still some degree of mild hypothermia. We suspect that that affects outcome, 
whether that's true or not will have to be proven by new large studies. Thanks a lot. <laughs>